Okay, so I am going to be talking about the commemorations for October the 7th. There's an article about it here in the Saturday Telegraph. And so I'm going to be reading bits of that. I want to tell you it's not for the squeamish or the faint-hearted. I'm not monetizing this. I can control that on YouTube. I can tell them I don't want it monetized. But BitChute, Rumble and Minds, uh, they just do it. So if you see adverts, it's not with my consent. It's just the way it is on that particular platform. I'm Granny Opterix and I'm on YouTube, Rumble, BitChute and Minds. So this item here was written by Alison Pearson and it concentrates mostly on this woman. She is, uh, this, this lady here is um, an architect, I think it, it said. I read the article first. I'm afraid I'm a little bit um, unsettled by it. Anyway, uh, this lady here signed up to uh, uh, look after dead bodies. Apparently, according to Jewish law, a woman, women should deal with dead female bodies. And there are uh, sort of semi-professional women who do this. But there was um, a contingency plan that if there was some sort of a disaster, people, uh, civilians, would sign up for uh, doing this service to the dead. And this woman is one of them, and she was interviewed by Alison Pearson. Uh, so Alison Pearson said, as Sir Tom Stoppard uh, observed exactly a year ago, who can say where Israel's response to October the 7th will sit in the calculus of suffering? Um, we are aware that Jews are not the only victims of this tragedy, uh, but the consequences did not weigh with Hamas. Before we take up a position on what's happening now, we should consider whether this is a fight over territory or a struggle between civilization and barbarism. And uh, indeed, uh, that's what it was. Whatever, uh, I am going to get comments here about uh, retaliation, not retaliation, about um rising up against oppression. Uh, you have to remember that Israel was not in Gaza and had left Gaza in 2005. So they had not been in Gaza for years. Uh, and that there was a border between Israel and Gaza and also a border between Gaza and Egypt. So it wasn't that like Israel was keeping the people in Gaza incarcerated there. They talk about the, the biggest open air prison in the world. First of all, Gazans worked in Israel and they, were, they came out every day of Gaza. Yes, there were border controls. That's because some of them had been known to go on the rampage with knives. We know all about knives in Europe, don't we? The border between Gaza and Egypt didn't allow anyone from Gaza across. There were some uh, technical, uh, well, that's okay. Certain people could get across uh, in very reduced numbers, but it wasn't just going in and out daily. And some uh, merchandise went across as well. But again, very strictly controlled. On the other hand, the border between Israel and Gaza in many cases was just a fence. That was what Hamas had broken through with a... Um... In fact, I'll show you, I'll find a photograph of the border between Egypt and Gaza and you'll see the difference. Uh, between Israel and Gaza, it was like a chain link fence in most 
cases, as far as I could tell. But between uh, Egypt and Gaza, it's like two walls, you know, all the way with a sort of trench in between. I'll, I'll have to find it now, but I'll, I'll put it up here. Uh, so the, uh, there were many Gazan men and women who went to work in the local industries and the uh, kibbutzim in that area. And horrifyingly enough, some of them who'd been working there for 20 years, uh, they were the ones who supplied Hamas with the information they needed, you know, where the uh, kibbutz uh, children's uh, uh, nursery was, where uh, various armed police might be, where uh, old people's uh, living quarters were, a a anything like that. And so they had maps of each one of these villages and um, farms in the south of Israel, which is horrifying enough. And I was listening to somebody else about this just, well, yesterday. Oh, yes, it was Victor Hansen. And he said that the fault lay to a certain extent with the Israelis because they got too complacent about it. They would say things like, well, you know, they have a better standard of living, working for us, and they get medical attention that they wouldn't get uh, in, uh, even if they could get into Egypt. And they, uh, they live a much better life because they can coexist with us. So they are going to coexist with us. That's, uh, and they, they just, they just forgot about the barbarism that lay underneath all of this. They didn't even realize it was there. I remember hearing about one woman who spent most of her time ferrying Gazan children to hospital from Gaza into, I suppose, Jerusalem or wherever the nearest big hospital was for medical attention. And she was burnt to death in her shelter, apparently. Uh, anyway, yes, so uh, I don't know how I got onto that. Um, I think I got onto that because I didn't want to get onto this. Uh, let's just read some of this. This is from uh, this woman. Uh, it was one of the happiest days of the year. She was apparently quite fairly religious. Uh, a, a, a holiday was scheduled to start at sundown at the end of Sabbath, a Jewish holiday that celebrates the conclusion of the annual cycle of Torah readings. There's a lot of food and dancing. So the siren woke up Shari Mendes in her family's apartment in Jerusalem. Uh, they thought it was a mistake, uh, she and her husband. Oh, yes. So she's an architect and her husband is a surgeon. They went down to the shelter and uh, it seemed to be a false alarm. So they came back upstairs and started to get dressed. We were getting ready to go to the synagogue. And then there was another siren and another. People kept going back downstairs into the shelter with each siren at a different stage of dress, half dressed, almost dressed. It was quite funny. The Mendeses didn't have their phones switched on because they don't use electricity uh, on the Sabbath. After a while, now look at this. After a while, Arab neighbours came up to show them the news on their phones. So you see, it's not like uh, these are Israeli Arabs and they are just as worried about this sort of thing as the Jewish Israelis are because they know what's going to happen to them. If, if Hamas takes in. In fact, I did hear there were a couple of Arabs uh, among that dance festival uh, and they were murdered. Uh, one of them went back uh, to, uh, he said, well, I speak Arabic and I'm a Muslim, so they'll be nice to me. They weren't nice to him at all. Uh, they, uh, they tortured him to death, apparently. Uh, so anyway, they came up to show them the news on their phones. We were horrified, says Shari. She switched on her own phone to find emergency order number eight. 
she realised it was war. And on Saturday night, Shari drove to the Shura army base and joined her unit. Right, I have to warn you, this is quite disturbing. My first shift was Sunday morning, she says. It was unimaginable. There were refrigerator trucks lining up as far as you could see. There's this massive intake area like an airport hangar and it was packed with bodies. Body bags stacked one on top of each other right up the walls. Hundreds of bodies. The smell was incomprehensible. Uh, She said she was struggling to breathe. The floors were wet. Fluids were dripping from the bags. There was blood on the floor. So much blood. It was like walking into horror. Uh, Around Shari and the team, people were working at record speed, putting up sheetrock walls to create new rooms to stack the bodies in, bringing in more and more shipping containers with refrigeration and shelves. Shari's first job was in the identification room. I can't overemphasize how shocking this was, even to professionals. Like there were forensic forensic doctors and army photographers and army dentists and army physicians all in this room, gathered around a girl's body trying to establish who she was. It says here, there's an imperative in Judaism that the modesty of the dead woman should be respected. Shari says that was what her team were trying to do. I am reminded of the videos we saw of Shani Locke, uh, a young woman who was at this festival, and her body had been brought into Gaza on the back of a truck, and everybody was hitting the body and spitting at it. And by everybody, I mean the Gaza residents, not Hamas, although Hamas were the ones in the, in the truck sitting on the body. Um, uh, but uh, what a difference between these guys even in the Russian horror we said please let's cover the body when no one's working on it and everyone said yes let's cover her I was very touched by that you know that takes sensitivity in the midst of that unimaginable nightmare Uh, we were taking things out of pockets like cigarette lighters We wiped the blood, put it in a special bag with a number to go into a certain box to be returned to her parents. Uh, The team did their best to take off jewellery. Sometimes it was very difficult. The young women had nose rings and their faces were completely smashed up. The women were shot many times in the head. Why? 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 We saw that these women were shot to be killed, maybe in the heart, in the head, but then they were shot many times in the face and it looked like systematic mutilation because it seemed like they wanted to ruin these women's faces. A lot of them were young soldier women and a lot of them had been very beautiful. The first few we saw weren't too bad because they might have been caught in their sleep and Hamas just shot them. But after a while, we got women who had clearly been awake when they were murdered. And these women came in and their mouths, their teeth were in grimaces and their hands were clenched if they had hands. We got notified that a woman's coming in. She has no legs. So the terrorists cut off her legs. There was clearly immense sadistic violence. A lot of the women had bloody stained underwear. Shari says some had no underwear at all. People were shot in the breast. They were shot in the crotch. And that was not done to kill them. One body Shari dealt with personally still had a knife stuck through her mouth. There was so much violence and it was totally sexual. Now, we had Kemi Badenoch, um, who's gone round the internet recently because she said some cultures are not as um, not as good as other cultures, not as advanced or something like that. And the interviewer was saying, go on, give me an example of a culture that isn't as advanced or as good as ours. Well, Here you are, 
interviewer, whoever you are. Calling the men who did this savages. Calling them men. Calling them men is an insult to men. Calling them savages is an insult to savages. There was something else there. I, uh, I, mean, I would call it satanic if I believed in Satan. But my belief is that Satan is there, you know, inside each of us. But most of the time we can conquer that. These people, they just, they didn't even want to conquer it. They wanted to destroy. And from what they were doing, looking at the way they mutilated those girls, they just wanted to destroy anything beautiful. I'd say that's a definition of Satanism. This is a young man called Nimrod. At the Alumim Junction, he counted 23 bodies. All of them were kids, like young adults. I didn't know about the Nova Festival. I was asking why they dressed like that. Near the roadside, he found the body of a young woman, her trousers pulled down, her underwear, blood on her backside. Instinctively, Nimrod started to dress her. Of course they raped women, Nimrod almost shouts. On one terrorist body, he found a detailed map of the kibbutzim and a list of Hebrew phrases. Pull your pants down was one of them. It was hard to preserve evidence, he said, because everyone was picking up the bodies as fast as possible. Hamas was still kidnapping the dead and taking them over the border. He will never forget the carnage he witnessed in places like Kibbutz Be'eri. I saw it all, women raped, dead kids in cars, families burnt, some with body parts, some without, and the damage to the buildings like a tornado passed. I saw the Holocaust, he said. So many dead bodies, many mutilated. The creativity of the deaths was overwhelming. A head speared on a rake. Hamas terrorists took their time. We didn't have an army that day. I've seen what happens to the Jewish people without an army. All right. Well, I think I've, I've read enough, actually. What can we take away from this? That there are some cultures that are so unutterably barbaric, that they shouldn't be allowed to persist. Israel should be allowed not to kill every Gazan, obviously, and that's obviously not their intention, but to get rid of this sort of culture from amongst them. And it's not just Hamas, I'm sorry to say. After Hamas went in, Ordinary Gazan townspeople wandered over to the kibbutzim and finished off wounded people or uh, looted the houses, looted what was left, took the food, uh, that's, that sort of thing. With no sense of, yeah, and of course there's always the abusing bodies and handing out sweets in the town square to celebrate death in this sort of way. Right, well, that's in memory of the event that I made a video last year. It kept me awake for many nights and now it's going to keep me awake tonight, I suppose. Okay, till next time.